Welcome to the Introduction to Computer Science, Security and Privacy. This is Lecture C. The component Introduction to Computer Science provides a basic overview of computer architecture, data organization, representation and structure, the structure of programming languages, and networking and data communication. It also includes the basic terminology of computing. The objectives for this unit, Security and Privacy, are to define cybercrime and cybersecurity, List common information technology or IT security and privacy concerns. List the hardware components that are usually attacked by hackers. Explain some of the common methods of attack. Describe common types of malware. Explain social engineering methods used by cyber criminals. Describe methods and tools available for protection against cyber attacks. Describe practices designed to minimize the risk of successful cyber attack. Address specifics of wireless device security. Explain security and privacy concerns associated with electronic health records, or EHRs. Describe security safeguards used for healthcare applications. And provide the basics of ethical behavior online. In this lecture, we'll discuss the methods and tools available to prevent computer security breaches, including authentication, authorization, encryption, antivirus software, firewalls, and intrusion protection systems. Authentication is the beginning of network security. In an authentication process, a user provides valid credentials, the most common of which are a username and password. After the user enters their credentials, the computer authenticates those credentials against its user account's database. If the credentials entered by the user match those in the user account's database, the user is authenticated and is granted access to the system. Servers typically authenticate users through an Active Directory database, which stores information about all users, user groups, computers, printers, and other objects managed by the server. Combining authentication types is known as multi-factor authentication. One-factor authentication, which we just discussed, is the simplest authentication process, involving only a username and password. In addition to a username and password, two-factor authentication requires another authentication type, such as a smart card or a biometric reader. With three-factor authentication, some kind of a biometric reader, such as a fingerprint reader or retinal scanner, is required, in addition to a username and password and a smart card or badge. After authentication, the next step in preventing computer security breaches is authorization. Authorization is the process of specifying a user's permissions. In other words, the authorization process determines what actions the user has the authority to perform. To allow users to store files on a server, the network would first authenticate and then authorize the users, granting read and write access to a specific network drive. Examples of the permissions an authorized user may have include permission to print files, to access specific network drives, to view and change documents and folders, or to use email. As an additional security feature, a user's actions are usually recorded. Those records come in handy if a security breach needs to be investigated. Another tool used to improve computer and network security is encryption. Encrypted files or encrypted communication is unreadable to unauthorized viewers. Each piece of encrypted information has its own private and public key set. This means if a user encrypts a file on his or her computer, the user possesses what is known as the private key set. To allow someone to decrypt that communication requires providing them with the public key set since those two keys are required to enable decryption of this specific piece of communication. A common example is email encryption. A patient might encrypt an email sent to a doctor by using a private key through the installation of an encrypting program in the email client. For example, a Microsoft Outlook private key encrypts outgoing mail. The email sent to the doctor includes its public key so that the doctor can read the email. All communication encrypted using a private key through the email client is protected and only those in possession of the public key can read it. Further, a medical office might encrypt data stored on a server's hard disk using its private key and allow the patient to decrypt the data using the medical office's public key. On the upper right side of the slide is a screenshot of a Microsoft Excel 2010 document where a user has clicked the File menu, clicked Info, and then clicked Protect Workbook. Notice that one of the options in the list is to encrypt with password. Encrypting a document essentially scrambles the document's contents. When a file is encrypted, the only way its contents can be read is to enter the required password, which decrypts the file. Any Microsoft Office file can be encrypted or password protected in this way. 
Suppose you create, encrypt, and close a Microsoft Word document. When you want to open the document, double-clicking on it opens a password dialog box, shown at the bottom right of the slide. The presence of the password dialog box indicates that the document is protected or encrypted and that a password is required to open it. If you type in the correct password, the document will open. If you forget the password, you will be unable to open the document. The contents of any folder on a Windows-based PC can be encrypted. To encrypt an existing folder, go to Windows File Explorer and locate the folder to be encrypted. Right-click on it. Select Properties from the context menu. The Properties dialog box opens as shown on the upper right side of the slide. Next, click Advanced. Click Encrypt Contents to secure data to encrypt all of the documents in the folder. Next, click OK to apply the setting to the folder and all of its contents. Subsequently, all files placed in this folder will be encrypted. This means that files in this folder can be viewed only when the user is logged into the computer with the username and password used to encrypt the folder. All other user accounts will receive an Access is Denied message when they try to open any file in the encrypted folder. Requiring all devices to have antivirus software installed is yet another way to mitigate security threats. Antivirus, or AV software, prevents, detects, and removes viruses. Several methods of detection are used to identify viruses. The most common method, signature-based detection, identifies viruses by comparing the contents of a file to the database of known virus signatures. Therefore, AV software requires up-to-date virus pattern definitions. As new viruses and new attacks become known, the AV software vendor updates the ability of AV software to catch and then quarantine malicious actions. AV software searches computer files for virus signatures. AV software is able to read a computer's files and determine if a file is infected with a virus. If the AV software finds what it sees as a virus, then the AV software quarantines the file. AV software also monitors for malicious computer activity. For example, if a running program attempts to perform an unfamiliar action, the AV software will stop and quarantine that program and its action or actions. For example, if Microsoft Excel started a search or attempted to communicate over the network to a website without the user being a part of that process, AV software should stop that from happening. Common anti-malware or AM software vendors include Malwarebytes, Avast, AVG Free, Kaspersky, McAfee, Symantec, Spybot, AdAware, Trend Micro, and Bitdefender. It is important to perform a web search for anti-malware software vendor rankings before investing in anti-malware software. Many computer magazines annually rank AM software vendors. It's a good idea to invest in the commercial version of reputable anti-malware software, one that includes automatic updates rather than rely on a free version. The cost of $50 or $60 a year is nothing compared to the pain of having your personal data stolen or your computer's data held for ransom. Another way to mitigate security threats is to implement a firewall in the network. A firewall is software or hardware that blocks unauthorized communication to and from a computer, or from one network to another network. The Windows operating systems, or OSs, provide what is known as the Windows Firewall, which should almost always be enabled to protect a home or small office desktop computer system. Routers have basic firewall protection built into their OS functionality. Most Internet Service Providers, or ISPs, routers act as firewalls. A local network that uses DSL, or some other type of Internet access that is always on, is protected from infiltration because the ISP's device acts as a firewall, preventing that communication from entering the network. A firewall inspects each piece of communication and then permits or denies that traffic based on its configured rules. For example, you will not be able to connect to a shared printer at another company unless both companies' firewalls are configured to allow that communication. This slide contains a screenshot of the Windows 7 firewall. Look for the text that reads, Help protect your computer with Windows Firewall. The Windows Firewall can prevent hackers or malicious software from gaining access to a computer through the internet or a network. The green shield indicates that the firewall is functioning. The firewall is set to block all connections to programs that are not on the list of allowed programs. The firewall can also be configured to allow a program or a feature through the Windows firewall. This is known as punching a hole in the firewall. Looking at the center of the slide, notice that the Windows firewall is currently configured to notify me when Windows firewall blocks a new program. 
When this computer is connected to a public network, such as those in places like airports or coffee shops, the Windows firewall state is on. In such locations, incoming, unsolicited connections are blocked. In corporate or healthcare environments, where data security is paramount and cannot be compromised, employing a hardware device known as an Intrusion Protection System, or IPS, is advised. An IPS is similar to a firewall but provides much more protection. The IPS monitors all network traffic in real-time for malicious activity. Real-time means the device examines traffic as the traffic occurs, not by capturing the traffic and examining it later. The purpose of the IPS is to stop intrusions and then alert network administrators to the threat. This concludes Lecture C of Security and Privacy. In summary, this lecture we reviewed some of the methods and tools available to prevent computer security breaches.